Hi, everyone. Well, thanks for joining me to talk about cyber insurance, um, which is what everyone wants to talk about at DragonCon, right? Um, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about it. I really like it. Um, I'll give you guys a little bit of background about me. I'll like generally chat about things for 20, 30, 35 minutes and then open it up for questions. Um, you know, very free form. If I'm talking and something, you know, exigently comes up and you want to chat, just walk up to the microphone, ask a question. No problems whatsoever. Um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm an attorney by trade. I got out of private practice because it was terrible and serendipitously ended up doing insurance claims. It started off with employment practices liability and directors and officers liability claims. And then in 2013, I was sitting giving a presentation on a large loss when a technical claims director asked me if, or asked the entire room, does anyone know what a Bitcoin is? And I was the only one that knew what it was. Um, Cause I had recently found out about cryptocurrency earlier that year was messing around with a little bit. Um, no, I did not keep all of my Bitcoin because if I did, I would probably be doing this virtually on my Island. Um, but I, fell in love with kind of decentralized currency and cryptocurrency and kind of did a deep dive into it. So I'm trying to explain this to a room full of insurance executives um, that are on the, the farther side of, of 4550 at the time. And nobody understood a word I was saying. So I decided, hey, you know what, maybe I can draft a white paper, discuss blockchain, you know, ledger technology and its impact on insurance. And so I did. And it was well received. And a couple of weeks later, they're like, hey, Rich, we want you to be the subject matter expert on the drafting of our novel cyber insurance policy. And up until that point, I had never even heard of cyber insurance um, because <laughs> I don't know if anybody in here works in insurance. Nice. Um, it's it's a very broad, yes, sir. Oh, you work in insurance? Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Awesome. Um, yeah, so um, there. it's weird. Like I find out new things in the world of insurance like every week it seems and it's just such a broad area of, of study and you know um, companies and things like that so I spent the next six weeks drafting a cyber insurance policy and um, if you do work in insurance drafting a policy is probably the most edifying thing you can do to actually see how it works together because I, I know me like I, I am an attorney a trained attorney that does insurance coverage work, insurance policy drafting, and there are policies that I don't understand, right? And that's a little weird, right? Like you, you are entering into a contractual agreement with a company to reimburse you in the case of loss, and you have no idea what the insurance policy says, right? Um, and so when you write a policy, it really, you, you build it from the nuts and bolts, and you see the interplay r regarding the different provisions and terms and conditions and things like that. And so I fell in love with cyber insurance. It was so novel to me, so cool um, that, you know, hey, we insure like cyber attacks. Like that's crazy. You know, like I get professional liability. I get, you know, home fire, wind, tornado stuff like that makes sense. But to insure a company against someone gaining unauthorized access to their computer systems, that's kind of cool. Um, and so over the course of my career, I progressively more and more worked on cyber insurance, data privacy related claims and things like that. And in the course of that, I became a, a fellow of information privacy with the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Um, you know, I've worked on hundreds, if not a, a couple thousand uh, ransomware claims. Um, I don't know if anyone was here for my ransomware panel yesterday. Um, and through that time, I've seen cyber insurance really, really kind of develop and change, right? Because initially, a cyber insurance policy was worried about unauthorized access to personal identifiable information, data breaches, right? That was the big thing. Remember Yahoo, right? Like, or not yet. Yeah, Yahoo and then Target. That's the one that like really brought data breaches kind of into the, the, the public like consciousness, right? And all of them, right? Like there's, there's so, so many. And, you know, for the longest time it was really, okay, how do we safeguard this data? And you had the European Union, um, some states, um, California, Massachusetts, that started to create these kind of privacy statutes, right? Because in the technological revolution of our society, 
what is the number one currency? Data, right? How much stuff do we do and we get for free? Like, you know, my phone, like how many apps do I got on here? They don't charge me anything, right? But what do they take for me? My data. And so it took a long time, you know, like there wasn't really any privacy statutes in like the 90s. Um, you know, and, and Europe, as often they do, was kind of leading this. They had their general data protection regulation, GDPR. Before that, they had their, their re the data, regula data regulation protection statute that was similar to the GDPR. But now we're seeing this massive movement towards a regulating framework for data. And how do you protect that data, right? And so cyber insurance over the past couple of years has just gone bonkers, specifically post COVID, right? Because everybody ran to work from home. They couldn't be in the office where you had hopefully good security protocols and hardened for, you know, networks to home. And it's like, hey, how do I get access to my work stuff? It's like, oh, you know what? We'll just give you access to this server. All right. Do I need a password? Nah, you're good. You're not good. Right. And so cyber insurance has this kind of two parts to it. The protection of data, right, or to reimburse a company that has to protect or notify individuals whose data has been impacted. And then also the protection of a company who's had a security failure or unauthorized access to their computer systems. Right. And so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about a general cyber policy, just so you guys kind of know about it um, and what that is. And so you have a better kind of understanding of what a cyber insurance policy covers. And it's going to be really quick. And if you guys want to ask additional questions, I'm more than happy for that. But generally, a cyber insurance policy now covers both first party claims and third party claims. First party claim is where the named insured under the policy, the person that purchased the policy is damaged. OK, so if you have a property policy or an auto policy, you're typically a first party insured under that policy. And there's also third party coverages in a lot of policies. And so that's kind of what you would think of if you had a malpractice policy or an errors and emissions policy. But most cyber policies, they say, hey, if, if the, the named insured committed a security failure or data breach or privacy liability or something else, we'll reimburse you for any claims made against you or we'll indemnify you for any claims that are made against you. So those are two important things because you can actually have a claim that triggers both sides of that, right? Like the Equifax breach. Equifax was damaged because they had to do a lot of, you know, remediation and investigation into the breach. But then every single, you know, American with social security number was also damaged, right? And they made claims against Equifax. And so cyber policies are really important, especially for smaller businesses, because you do have the potential, you know, because typically on, on other policies, like one thing gets hit, right? Like you have a, a home insurance policy, roof gets ruined by hail, right? Okay, great. You don't typically have hail, tornado, you know, or maybe I guess you do would have hail and tornado. That's a terrible example. But like hail and, and fire or, you know, something like that it doesn't trigger like every provision of the policy. But in cyber incidents, sometimes it does. Okay. And, and again, the prototypical coverage is what some carriers will call like a breach response cost. And so what this is, is it usually entails the retention of legal counsel, retention of an incident response firm to investigate and determine you know, the scope of the exposure and, and security failure. Also notification to any impacted individuals whose personal identifiable information might have been accessed or exfiltrated. And that's something important to think about there too, right? Like it's not just your data being taken that requires notification in most jurisdictions, it's just access to it. And so that could be a crazy cost. So like, oh, they only had access to this email inbox for five minutes. It's like, all right, but what'd they download in those five minutes? You know, um, so the cost can be large. And then also something that's really cool about cyber insurance is there's usually a digital asset restoration covered. So say you get hit with ransomware, and you got to rebuild your network. That's something that might be paid. And then obviously business interruption. If you can't function with your business, extra expense coverage is to like keep your business up and running while you're bit like. So if you need to purchase some computers to keep your business up and running because everything's encrypted. Right. then that might be a coverage available to you. And so having this kind of coverage is really, really important because if you've been paying attention to the ransomware epidemic or the funds transfer fraud epidemic or just the electronic crime epidemic that we're going through, um, people are getting hit hundreds, if not thousands of times a week. And oftentimes they do not have the expertise in which to respond to an incident. 
the money to make themselves whole if they've been damaged in an incident, right? Or the technical knowledge, like I said before, the expertise, but also the ability to actually recover from the incident. Because I've been on the phone with insureds and clients where it's like, hey, I have a 50-year-old business and uh, all of my computers are encrypted. I have data going back to the, the, the my great-grandfather started this business and it's lost. Like, what do we do? I say, well, you bought good insurance. So let's negotiate with the bad actors, right? Try to get your data back. You know, and we could talk about, you know, ransomware payments and whatnot a little bit. Um, that was the majority of my talk yesterday. But, you know, the thing is, is with these epidemics, cyber insurance has caused a lot of controversy, right? Is it causing the ransomware epidemic? Is it actually, like, increasing the amount of crimes that are being undertaken? And, you know, I don't know, does fire insurance cause arson? Man, no. No, it doesn't. Not at all. Right. Um, but, you know, cyber insurance is, is very controversial because, number one, in a lot of a lot of times you're paying criminals. Right. Like, I guess the fire insurance analogy, if you would basically pay someone who threatens to set fire to your building, would your fire insurance policy cover that? No. It, Right. So, and the, the person speaking said if, if the arson could cause a fire from anywhere in the world, it'd be different. And you're absolutely correct, right? Because we've actually seen property damage from ransomware threat actors. A person died a couple of years ago in a German hospital because of things being encrypted during a ransomware attack. And so, I, and I, I guess I should start off with this too. I have a very natural bias in regards to cyber insurance because it's something that I, I do as a, a living and I enjoy and I'm passionate about. So I, I personally think that it's a valid form of risk mitigation, and it's something that's very, very important for a lot of businesses to have. Um, I'm not just saying that because, you know, I work for a cyber insurance carrier and they pay my bills, but because I talk to people that are going through the worst day of their life in a lot of ways, if not literally the worst day of their life, and I get to make it better. And I get to say, hey, you got good insurance. In 30 minutes, we're going to be on the phone with counsel and forensics. And if, you know, we need to pay the ransom, you know, we'll, we'll negotiate with them. We'll get that down and we'll pay it. Um, but, um, you know, as the legal framework changes, as the regulatory framework changes, you know, there's going to be challenges and there's going to be additional contra controversy with cyber insurance. Um, you know, there's some, you know, legal liabilities where you really can't have insurance pay things. Right. And is that going to happen with cyber insurance? Like in some states and municipalities are now it's illegal to pay ransom. I think Florida, um, South Carolina, maybe a couple other states. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what what do you do then? Because the insurance policy can't make a payment. But then are they then able to leverage the other parts of the policy, like the digital asset restoration coverage, the business interruption coverage? And so you're actually causing a, a larger risk via private companies uh, by not paying ransom. And so, you know, cyber insurance is here to stay. I think it's one of those things where it's it's going to be a, a multi, multi-billion dollar market. Um, I don't think computers are going to go away anytime soon, at least hopefully, because I'm not up on my survival knowledge. Um, and, you know, it's going to be some, a way that we can protect companies and individuals. Um, something that's coming now kind of down the pipe and some companies are doing stuff is personal cyber insurance. And so I don't know if you've seen it on maybe your auto policy or your home policy or something like that. You have an option to buy uh, data breach protection. Um, I've even seen electronic bullying coverage, which I'm 100% against bullying, right? But I, I don't quite understand that coverage. Um, but, you know, some of these companies, they will offer reimbursement for counseling and things like that, you know, which is pretty cool. But, um, you know, the, the thing about cyber insurance, too, and some of the other controversies is in, in the, the premium one right now is the war in Ukraine. OK, uh, because most insurance policies have something called a war exclusion. Right. So if Russia bombed New York. Insurance policies aren't going to say, "Hey, we're going to we're going to pay for the damages that you suffered," right? Because it's a it's a peril or a risk that you can't quantify. You can't 
evaluate that, right? Because let's not forget, insurance is a business and they want to make money. Now, they make money by paying out claims, but they make money by getting more premium than the claims they pay out, right? And so right now, there's a lot of discussion about do war exclusions cover something that's not technically a war? Right, it's a special military operation, and you know we don't know because a lot of those war exclusions were created and drafted well before like technology, right? So if Ukraine Ukrainian hackers send some type of ransomware variant to Russia, or Russian hackers send something to to Ukraine that then goes west, um, is that something that a cyber policy would cover? And the question, the, the answer is always it depends, right? Do you have a question? Um, I was just going to ask um, how you feel prevention fits into cyber insurance. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a great question. And so one of the controversies in, in cyber insurance right now, and, and let me back up just a minute, and, and, I'll, and I'm going to stay on point, I promise. So insurance policies for years, the way you underwrote them was you asked a series of questions, you look generally at the, the company that you're underwriting in the marketplace to get information on it, and that was it. Okay, and cyber insurance was incredibly, stupidly profitable for decades, basically until COVID. All right, and then COVID hit, all these additional claims came in, and people lost their minds. And by people, I mean senior stakeholders and boards of large insurance companies. Okay, um, not to get too insurance but like, uh, a, a combined ratio, a con combined ratio is basically the, the the ratio of premium over claims and expense. So it's essentially a, a quick and easy way to say, okay, is an insurance company profitable? All right. And so your combined ratio, you want under 100%. And the reason you want it under 100% is because insurance companies, they take your policies, right? So if you have a million dollar policy, right, that means the insurance company somewhere or a company they do business with somewhere has a million dollars in a bank account. It has to be capitalized, right? That's why we have Department of Insurance, you know, regulations and regulatory entities in all 50 states, right? So you have to be properly capitalized. And what they do with that money is they invest it, okay? So the insurance companies get money from premium and investment proceeds. Now, with that combined ratio, or the loss ratio, which is you know a, a little bit different, but basically the same thing for our purposes today, is under 100% or over 100%. That means that they're going into those investment profits. Okay, so massive claims, massive loss of money. What do insurance companies do? Do you think they broaden coverage? Noob. Do you think they continue doing what they're doing? Noob. Do you think they completely freak out and try to do a lot of different things at the same time? Yep. Okay, and when they're doing this, one of the main things they do is increase premium, right? Reduce limits of liability, okay? And then also try to narrow their coverages by changing the, the, the verbiage of the policies, right? Like, hey, if we, you know, something um, Chubb did is they have this widespread event coverage, which they've touted as, you know, really, really cool. But basically what it says is that if you don't properly patch your things, we're not going to cover something, Okay. Now, is that a good thing? Eh, not really for the consumer, right? But so what has happened is since before COVID, cyber insurance was so cheap, all of these different companies are trying to do different things to create value add, right? Because if you have an ISO policy or regular policy that they're basically all the same, same coverages, same prices, how do you add value? And some companies, coalition, at bay, others have started providing active type insurance, okay? Like monitoring your systems, looking at during the underwriting process, your actual domain infrastructure. And Coalition obviously is the, is the lead of this in the marketplace, okay? And they do this and they've been wildly successful. Like their claims frequency is like three to four times less than the general marketplace because they do this stuff because they're active, actually looking at the, the, the domain infrastructure and the network footprint of, of an insured, okay? And so active 
mitigation, active prevention on a cyber insurance policy is, I think, right now, very important. And it's going to continue to move forward. Because if you have these entities that, frankly, are giving you extra services for your premium that are going to protect you, that's a benefit. So thank you for the question. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so something is going on where uh, a lot of small companies cannot afford cyber insurance. It's just outside of their ability to spend the money. And so incident responders are starting to provide breach warranties, which is not insurance. However, it was described to me that if you, small businessman, actually have a breach, and after you've done everything we told you to do, like a, like a uh, managed service provider says mm -hmm. this, um, we will pay out and cover this. So what do you think about these breach warranties as opposed to cyber insurance and is this a good idea for small businesses to right. do? Yeah, so you got to read the, the warranty information. Because I've read some of these. They are very, very narrowed coverage. Most of the times they require some type of installation on your endpoints. And if you do not properly inst install these, you know, the software or whatnot, the warranty is void. They're often very limited um, in what they cover, right? They might just be something that provides coverage for the reinstatement of your network, which again, might be valuable, right? But what type of business do you work in or does the entity work in? Do they have a lot of personal information? Does it allow you to retain a breach coach or a privacy counsel so that you, then you can encapsulate the entire investigation under attorney work product privilege? You know, so you have to read it, compare it to a cyber policy. And the thing is, too, is, you know, cyber policies are getting more expensive, but there's also many, many cyber insurance companies, I've mentioned a couple of them today, that specifically focus on small, medium-sized businesses, okay? And the thing is, is you might not need $2 million in coverage. You might not need a $1 million in coverage, you know, because, and, and it depends on what you do, and, you know, because the big thing is, you know, do you have a lot of personal identifiable information? how much revenue are you making in a week or two weeks, right? So if you had a business interruption loss, like gosh forbid you got hit by a ransomware attack and your business was down for two weeks, what type of damages is that to you? You know, it's usually a net calculation. So net profit lost or net loss incurred. So it's not like gross, right? But, you know, what is that? You know, it's a lot of brokers are like, oh, you need a million dollars in coverage. You might not. You might need $2 million in coverage. You might not. And so even though the, the cyber market is what we call like a hard market right now, which versus a soft market, which means low premium, increased coverage, hard market is higher premium, lower coverage. It, it's kind of a weird, weird hard market because cyber insurance companies are still fighting tooth and nail for insurance. And if you have MFA on everything, if you have an EDR solution on your network, if you have very limited endpoints, if you're using G Suite versus Microsoft Office for an email tenant, don't use, don't use Microsoft Office for email tenant. I mean, you do, do what you need to do, right? I'm not here to provide that type of information. But 99.99999, all the way over there, of the business email compromises I've dealt with and all of my colleagues at multiple companies have dealt with have been on Microsoft 365 or Microsoft Outlook or Microsoft On-Prem Exchange. Because G Suite kind of has this kind of soft MFA on it. Um, and so if you have the appropriate like network framework put in place, your cyber insurance policy can be pretty cheap. And if it's not, shop around and you might have to go to a different broker. Because something to think about too from a cyber insurance context is most cyber insurance companies, actually all of them, I don't think any go direct to retail. So you have to go through a broker. Now the way the brokers work is you have retail brokers that actually work with the individuals that run a business. Um, but often they don't have expertise for specialty lines insurance like cyber. So what they'll do is they'll go through what's called a wholesale broker. So that wholesale broker will then go to the insurance company. So if you have a retail broker, isn't very sophisticated with cyber and is just giving you random quotes, they're too expensive, shop around. Go to a different broker. Get some of that. You know, because depending upon your coverage, depending upon your retention, you know, and you can talk, ideally, you should be talking to an insurance company that will answer these questions for you. Right? Because we're way past the time frame of hey, I can't talk to an insurance company and answer these questions or my broker doesn't know. You know, because everyone that has a business that works with computers should have cyber insurance. And if you don't, you need to try to get some. And so again, you know, I, you know, it sucks that it's getting more expensive, 
I do think that as um, the market changes and as more of the cyber insurance requirements for coverage like MFA everywhere and other things and other places um, changes, you're going to see a softening of the market. I mean, because a couple of years ago, you could get, you know, a million dollars of coverage for like a grant in some places, <laughs> you know, and this was on risks that had claims the prior year. So it's just, you know, it's been a little bit of a, a 180. No, one grand for a policy year. Yeah, and and so, so for the people on video, the gentleman asked for clarification on was it one thousand dollars a month? Yes, and no, it's it's for the actual policy period. So something that I can talk about too with cyber insurance policies that you need to understand is they're also called typically claims made and reported policies. So uh, your auto policy, your home policy is what what's called an occurrence based policy, which means. If you buy a policy for 2021 to 2022 and something happens within that policy period, you can make a claim whenever. You make a claim three years later. It's based going to be in that policy unless there's specific language that says you need to report it in a certain time frame. But a cyber policy is typically claims made and reported, which means the claim or incident needs to be discovered or made against you within that policy period and you need to report it within your policy period. Okay, and that's a very big distinction. Right. And but what that also means, though, is from a cyber insurance company perspective, ideally, after your, your policy period's over and any extended reporting period, they know how good of a risk you are. Right. And so if you've had cyber insurance for four or five years and you've not had any claims and you're satisfying the requirements that they're providing in the application, it should be a pretty good risk. Do you have a question? Yeah, actually, I do. I've never heard of a breach warranty before. Um, and I had heard you say South Carolina, and I happen to live in South Carolina. It's one of the states that won't pay out ransomware. So f four municipalities. Okay. Four, four municipalities. municipalities. Well, you know, I mean, our whole state taxpayer database was hacked. Right. Uh, maybe eight years ago, ten years ago, the whole state was compromised. Right. So, um, but I'm wondering, are these breach warranties used in place of ransomware, like, or, in, or rather in, in place of these... Um, Ransom pol insurance policies in those states. Yeah, they, so the, Is that the kind of a yeah. So the, the warranties are really really narrow, um, and and so I've seen them on primarily. I haven't really seen any MSSPs offer them, but I've seen them on software providers that do are like security, and they're like, hey, you install this on all of your endpoints. If you get hit with ransomware on any of the endpoints this is installed on we'll give you a million dollar warranty. Now, typically that warranty is, um, sometimes they do mention the payment of ransom. Now, if you if there's a state law or any law that says you can't pay ransom, that warranty is not gonna pay the ransom, right? So you can't get around it that way. Um, the problem with the warranties, again, is it's a very narrow coverage. And if there's any issues with the installation of the software or anything on it, you don't really have a recourse. Okay, something interesting about insurance policies is that there's a lot of legal, you know, precedent for them. If there's any ambiguity in an insurance policy, it will go to the policyholder. So there's a gray area in the policy, it could go either way. The way it's going to be interpreted is towards the policyholder than the insured. Warranties are different. It's a contractual relationship, more, more so of a contractual relationship than an insurance policy. So you're beholden by the terms of that, and it's very black and white, okay? And the thing is, is, you know, a lot of insurance carriers, too, what they'll do is they'll do kind of these, like, bumps on a, a business policy or a BOP for cyber cover, and it's very limited, right? You have $5,000 for funds transfer fraud. You have $5,000 for breach response, things like that. And depending upon the type of business you have, that might not be enough. So, you know, I... You know, read, read, read the terms and conditions. If you don't understand them, ask them um, and say outline, hey, if I have a ransomware event, you know, what costs am I going to incur as a result of this? And what is going to be covered? What is not going to be covered? You know, because it's very important to understand how you're going to be helped and, and what cyber insurance can do for you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, so my question is, um, so my policy is a little different probably. Um, I'm a mental health provider, 
And so this is an add-on to my liability insurance that we're all required to have as psychotherapists. And so this is a cyber insurance add-on and I mean, it actually wasn't that expensive, so I just added it on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not. Are, are you familiar with those? Yes, they, absolutely, okay, absolutely. That are yeah. used for mental health professionals, and mm -hmm. are they worth it? And pitfalls and things to look for. Sure. Um, it's actually not that common in our field to have this add-on. I don't think all the different liability policies have this, but the one that right. I have does. You know, recently within the last two years, have this as an additional add-on. Right. Thanks. Yeah. No. Definitely. So. And the reason that cyber insurance probably isn't super like well known or used in your field is because typically your malpractice policies have HIPAA coverage, right? And so HIPAA, so the two, like when you think about personal identifiable information, the two big bad babies in the house are PII, personal identifiable information, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, um, in, in one state, just your date of birth and name is considered PII, but we won't talk about that Dakota because we don't like them. Um, and then also private health information. Okay, so anything that is, you know, electronic private health information, it's very broad, any type of medical information whatsoever. So doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, mental health professionals, their malpractice insurance typically has like a supplemented coverage for HIPAA related claims. Now, a cyber insurance add on hopefully will have more coverage than just that because. If you don't have private health information that's impacted, your your regular liability policy might might not respond, right? Like if it's just social security numbers or you know driver's license numbers, things like that. And it also might not help you if you're dealing with a business email compromise, right? Like hey, how how do I deal with uh, uh, an attorney and a forensic team to investigate this and see okay was there unauthorized access to my email, right? Or you know a ransomware event, something like that. You know, so you want to look and say, okay, does it cover cyber extortion? Or also one of the big things that we're seeing a lot of, because um, personally I think the Ukrainian conflict, a lot of the ransomware threat actors are either fighting or fighting each other right now. So it's pretty crazy um, in my field, February 24th, like ransomware claims like drop like precipitously um, and are, are much lower than they were before then. Um, and now people seem to going towards business email compromises and funds transfer fraud. So ideally, your cyber add-on would have a limited funds transfer fraud coverage. So if you are making payments electronically or receiving payments electronically, there's some coverage for that. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier that uh, some claims might be denied if pitch systems aren't patched. What kind of standards does cyber insurance set forth and do they ever perform audits? Yeah, so you need to read your insurance policy specifically any exclusionary language. So maybe we can do just a deep dive into like what is on a policy. So the first thing that's gonna show up is your deck page or declarations. It's gonna outline the named insured, the address, the coverages that were purchased, and the limits of liability, right? After that, you're probably gonna have terms and conditions. Read through those, right? But the main thing that you wanna look at is insuring agreements or coverage grants. And you'll see it, it's pretty easy. That explains what is actually covered under the policy. Right. So typically first party, you'll say, all right, we'll pay for any breach response costs and expenses incurred after a discovered incident um, during the policy period, blah, 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 blah. Things will be bolded. You'll want to read those definitions to have a better understanding of the coverage that's provided. Now, the insuring grant, or insuring coverage, but we'll call it insuring grant because it grants coverage, can be modified by other provisions in the policy. The terms and conditions, but those won't be exclusionary. All right definitions because there might be something where breach response costs provide coverage only if uh, the individual whose personal identifiable information was accessed was was impacted so versus other customers that might be you know working with that entity some policies provide for voluntary notification um, but the exclusions and you'll see a big section that says exclusions will actually carve back coverage from the insuring grants right breach of contract exclusion war exclusion I mentioned earlier there might be a, uh, an exclusion that says you need to keep things patched, okay? Um, but it's going to depend specifically on the, the language of that exclusionary language. Um, sorry, it was a little redundant, redundant there. It's going to depend on the exclusionary language as written, okay? And so read it. If you don't understand it, ask your broker, ask the insurance company. But 
What I was discussing was in specific to the question on the uh, warranties that are being offered by some MSSPs and some software providers. Okay, and what they do is they'll say, uh, or I, one second, I remember I was actually talking about something else. But those will often say if it's not pro patched or properly installed, there's no coverage. But as we're dealing with, to your question, I apologize, um, as we're dealing with the hardening insurance market, carriers are trying to get to basically, you know, there's a carrot and a stick, right? The active insurance, the active risk management is kind of the carrot. The <laughs> very well-defined exclusionary language is the stick to ensure that companies are staying patched and updated. So there might be like a duty to cooperate provision or something like that that says if you do not properly remediate an incident or if you do not, you know, patch something, right? Because the specific language I was talking about was in, I believe, the Chubb policy, and they have this wide event, uh, a widespread event coverage. And so what they specifically do is they sublimate coverage for like Log4j, Microsoft Exchange, events like that, right? Now, there's some language in there that says that if you're not keeping up to date with things, then there might be an issue for coverage. And the way they audit that typically is during the investigation if they say there's an issue here. Right, because something else you have to watch out for too is being honest on any applications with cyber insurance. Like if you say, "Hey, I have MFA on my email account," or "I have an EDR solution in place," and you warrant that, and then you get hit with ransomware, and it's like, "Hey, did you have MFA on this VPN access to to your server?" And they're like, "Oh no, no, we just we didn't even have a password." You know, then it's like, "Okay, that's a coverage issue, potentially." But generally, um, cyber insurance carriers will not say, hey, surprise, we want to audit your protocols. That You'll usually have discussions about that on renewal or um, if, if a fact arises outside of an investigation that says, okay, there might have been a misrepresentation during the underwriting process. Um, but I can tell you cyber insurance carriers don't look for these things. It's not something where, oh, hey, we're doing an investigation here. We're really going to drill down and make sure they didn't lie. It's like, no, it's really, you know, if it comes up. Hi. Um, you had mentioned earlier that one of the Dakotas defines PIIs as only your name. Why is that? And could you also define MFA? Sure. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure it's North Dakota, but I'm I'm not dyslexic, but sometimes I feel like I am, and I always mix up North and South Dakota. Uh, but so every state has a privacy regulatory statute, and every state defines personally identifiable information differently. For the most part, the general rule of thumb is anything that can identify a household, right? So your name, date of birth, and a social security number, name, date of birth, banking information, name, date of birth, driver's license, things like that, right? Well, I think North Dakota or South Dakota. Um, if it's just your name and date of birth, that qualifies as PII. And so then you need to notify of a breach if that information has been accessed. And then MFA is multi-factor authentication. So for any type of log into a system, ideally you want to have multi-factor authentication or dual authentication. So you have credentials, login name, password, and some secondary method of authentication to verify you are who you are. So that can be SMS texts, although try to stay away from that, something like Google Authenticator, Authy, YubiKey, something just so that if your credentials do get stolen or if they do get brute forced, there's another method required to get you know, access to whatever it is you're trying to log into. Hi, I was wondering if you can clarify um, a little bit about how the legal system treats the geography of where the data is located. Sure. Um, as an example, because you're talking about states that, you know, ban paying ransom, but what if, you know, your company's headquartered in one of those states, but the data that's been breached is stored in the cloud elsewhere? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and it and, and my first day of law school, this really scary professor said, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know in five minutes about being a lawyer. And he's like, what is the answer to every question you're ever going to come across? No one picked it out. It's It, it depends, right? And, and so just like that, it, it depends. Um, because a lot of times data is, so the ransomware non-payment right now is only for new municipalities. So private entities are not banned from making a ransom payment. 
Now, we can get into questions about sanctions lists and things like that, but that's a little too far afield. But generally, um, what you're looking at in a, a cyber insurance claim context for that is where the company's domiciled and where any of their customers are domiciled. Okay, and really this comes up with definition of PII, how do you respond, your notification requirements, things like that, right? It also comes up in the data transfer context. If you have a Canadian company and a US company and you need to do an incident response investigation, Canada doesn't really like data to be stored outside of Canada or the, you know, gosh forbid the EU uh, because we don't have a, a data transfer agreement with them anymore after the privacy shield was ruled, ruled in, in, in invalid. Um, but generally in the cyber insurance context, it's where your, your customers are located because that's gonna determine how you notify when you have to notify, the type of credit monitoring being provided, things like that. Mm -hmm. yep. Hi. So there are assessments out there, NIST and ISO. Mm -hmm. So do you think smaller businesses uh, should follow those because I, I guess they're best practices so do you think it is okay or do you think it's within reason that a smaller business should follow every one of those best practices like is is that a way to secure a small business is by following those best practices or or just kind of is that a grain of salt kind of uh, yeah i mean um google doesn't follow all of nist and, and iso and even though they're certified, like it, it's it's really 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 hard to do, um, just because their standards are standards, right? Like for a man's reach should ever exceed his grasp, or what's happened for kind of thing, right? You try to get close, and maybe you, you get close, but it, it's it's very difficult to be NIST certified um, uh, or ISO certified, and so um, I think it's a good framework to look at. I think that um, CISA. Um, the federal government entity CISA, they're coming out with a lot of really good information lately about general protection for smaller businesses. Um, but really it's, you know, making sure that you're not reusing passwords. You have MFA, multi-factor authentication on email, any access into the network and have good backups. Um, something that I've, I've said, I said yesterday and I say it all the time and I have some technical friends that disagree with me because uh, they don't think it's, it's it's appropriate, but I do. It's as defenders, we need to be perfect, right? But as attackers, they just need to be lucky because human error accounts for like 88% of all cyber incidents, okay? And it's not, I mean, I had one claim once. It was a former CTO of a Fortune 100 company, CT, Chief Technology Officer, whose AOL.com email account got hacked. And um, which they were using with their accountant to transfer funds via email. And who they had told to their accountant, no, you don't need to call me to verify anything. So they promptly lost $450,000 and then blamed the account. <laughs> so, um, but, but generally to, to your question, right? Like it's, it's, you know, I call being hit by a cyber incident kind of winning the bad luck lottery, right? Um, because a lot, you know, typically a lot of things have to go wrong. You know, if you click on a phishing email, a lot of times nothing bad happens, right? And then you, something weird, squirrely happens with your email, you change your password, you're fine, right? Or, you know, I had one claim where the um, companies like to put like a lot of information on their website about who their chief executive officer is, who their president is. Don't put like your bookkeeper on your website or like, payments coordinator on the website um, because I had a one claim where an individual was using the email address officepresident2016 at gmail.com to send an email to the bookkeeper to process a wire transfer. And the bookkeeper, to, to their credit, knocked on the, the president's door and said, hey, is this wire good to go? And he's like, yeah. And then literally two weeks later in the middle of the night, he woke up and was like, what wire? And so we're reviewing this and the bad actor was clearly using this this email, used the president's name, but it showed Office President 2016. And Google apparently caught on because halfway through the conversation, it changed to Office President 2017 at gmail.com. There was no data breach. 
There's no email compromise. We, we investigated. It. it was just someone sending a random email. So you don't want, you know, better to, to replace good, right? Because the simplest things, education of employees, being kind of aware that, hey, if I'm processing payments or if I'm dealing with personally identifiable information, I need to be careful um, is really important. And the other thing I say a lot, too, is talk to people. I'm an elder millennial. I don't like talking to people on the phone, okay? Like, but I'd say, act like it's 1986, 1-800-CALL-ATT, whatever it is. Like, just talk to somebody on the phone if something weird is going on, you know? I mean, I've, I've dealt with claims with millions, multi-million dollar funds transfer fraud claims, okay? Where literally <laughs> the, the insured had the banking information rejected by the bank three times, three times, and then still processed an ACH. Never once thought, huh, this is weird. We've made 35 payments to these people over the past two years. Why is this not working? Let me call up this person I've been working with. You know, so yes, NIST, those standards, they're great. I'm not an overly technical person, um, but if you can follow them, awesome. Um, it can be very expensive to follow them. Um, and there's typically, you know, more cost effective ways to kind of mitigate your risk. One of which, getting cyber insurance. Any other questions currently? We have about 10 minutes left. I got another one, which sure. is a bit of a segue, but um, I saw your, your anecdote about buying Bitcoin and stuff like that. It got me a little excited because I'm involved in the blockchain world right now. So I was wondering, is that blockchain insurance something that you could talk about or have interest yeah in? so it's weird because i i've been trying to get into blockchain insurance for years because I, I i just you know again not overly technical so it's you know there's not a lot of you know blockchain claim adjuster gigs out there yet um but you know it's something that i think is going to be the future um, a lot of carriers a lot of cyber insurance carriers have actually refused to underwrite blockchain companies that is changing as blockchain becomes more important um, and, and more kind of mainstream. So um, I think blockchain companies do require cyber insurance, okay? Because, you know, funds transfer fraud might be a little bit difficult because you might not get covered for that. But, you know, I think eventually you're going to have wallet addresses be considered personal identifiable information. Heard it here first, DragonCon 2022. Okay, I'm serious. Because it, at a certain point, will be something that can identify you in the world. It already can. So, you know, if IP addresses can be considered PII in California and in the EU and the UK, why not a Bitcoin address? You know, um, and it's publicly available information. But when you take publicly available information with other things, much like the date of birth in North Dakota, you then have identifying information. And so, you know, I think it's going to be very important to see how blockchain companies integrate with cyber insurance going forward. So, yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, something that I really enjoy about cyber insurance is, you know, just how it's, it's really agile and changing. So this talk might be completely different next year. And in five years, it probably will be completely different. Um, I think in the UK and Australia, there's only like uh, like a, a like, and I could be completely wrong here. I'm, this is double hearsay, but like three to five percent of businesses have cyber insurance. So it's going to be bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to become. I mean, we're starting to see. I, I've started to see advertisements on TV for cyber insurance, which is wild to me because it's something that I never once thought to see on TV. Yes, sir. Are ransom demands almost exclusively made with cryptocurrency now? Do you ever see anything old school with wire transfer requests or anything? No, no, not at all. So we, we I have seen a couple, but they, they're usually like scatterbrained like email attempts where it's just like, oh, hey, um, sir, um, I know your internet browsing habits and your partner will be very upset if I tell them about this. Please send $500 to in PayPal or in, in Amazon gift cards to this email address. Um, so we've seen gift cards, but the vast, vast majority are Bitcoin and more variants are actually um, wanting to use Monero. And so if you're not familiar, Monero is a, a cryptocurrency that is uh, the first privacy coin. 
and it's able to, to a certain extent, and actually fairly well, hide recipients of, of the coin. And so the problem with Bitcoin, I suppose you could say problem from, from a ransomware threat actor perspective, is all the transactions are public and you're easily trackable. So a lot of variants, what they'll do is they'll say, hey, this is the demand in Bitcoin. If you pay in Monero, we'll give you 25% less demand because they can more easily hide their proceeds. Um, because blockchain tracking technology is really crazy right now. Uh, there's actually a blockchains panel tomorrow that I'm on. So please stop by, same room. Um, but, you know, as part of cyber insurance paying the ransom, there is kind of, one, I, I don't know if I'd really call it a controversy, but, um, you know, should we be going after these bad actors? Like actively going after them and trying to get these funds back that we spent. Now, the government's doing a good job of trying to go after them and, and in some cases getting some money back. But is that something the cyber insurance industry should do? You know, deploy a bunch of white hats to try to to get this money back because rent. Yeah, no, you're right. It is. Um, but the, the problem too is is like, you know, these bad actors in a lot of in a lot of ways, um, they're they're living free and with the full permission of doing what they do with the governments of where they live. You know, in Russia, Ukraine, other places. I mean, they know who Conti is, who Sodino Kibi is, things like that. And, you know, they're still allowed to do what they do. Um, with regards to bad actors, for the, the big, the bigger things, right? Not just like the little $500 in gift cards. Um, do you find that most of them reside outside the U.S. and especially outside U.S. Regu countries that are have agreement packs with the U.S.? Like, in those sanctioned companies? Do you find a lot of those hackers are out of there? Like what percentage? Yeah, I mean, the vast, vast majority. Um, the vast majority of bad actors in the ransomware space are outside the U.S. So it's actually interesting. A lot of the ransomware uh, malware, um, it will actually not encrypt um, computer systems that their root language is in Russian or Uzbeki or Ukrainian. So it will like things that are deployed as they go through different servers and things like that. If the the root link, and again, I'm, we're coming very close to my technical knowledge here, so I might be using the wrong terminology. But essentially, they can evaluate a computer system to see what language it's working in from like a language language perspective, not software language or anything like that. And if the root language is Russian or a bunch of other things, it won't encrypt. So they specifically target U.S., U.K., Western companies, um, you know, and a lot of these ransomware actors are are state nation groups: North Korea, uh, China, Russia. You know, they you know North Korea actually uses ransomware to fund a lot of what they do. So yeah, four more minutes left. I did have another question. Sure, um, that's great. Of the ransom, so say someone has a ransomware event, right? And they say, please, um, please send us a million dollars and we will unencrypt your stuff. How often of these, the larger population, actually truly unencrypt and don't leave something behind? Like, so they could get back into you. Like, do sure. they go back and hit them a second time? Like, we really don't see a lot of re extortion. Um, so, and you would have loved my chat yesterday, but um, so the thing is, is there's this weird kind of honor among thieves for unencryption, okay? Because if you don't get an actual decryption key, or not unencryption, decryption, if you don't get a decryption key, um, you're not going to get paid next time you do it, because it's a very small, small world of people that deal with this type of stuff, and as defenders, and so they will work with you. I've actually gotten um, after action reports from ransomware threat actors that will outline how they got into the system, how to patch the system, make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, and they'll, they'll even, they'll do their best to, to make sure like, hey, you know what, we're, you know, we're going to tell our affiliates not to attack you anymore. Thank you for your business. Okay. No, they do have customer service. Like the, uh, some of them have legitimate customer service websites. Like I've legitimately been told. Um, hey, thanks for so so. Th I appreciate your time. Negoti well, thank you for negotiating with us. I'm actually going on PTO for the next week. I'm going to hand you off to my colleague. If you have any questions, you can talk to my supervisor here. So if you have time, Conti was one of the, the greatest 
and most infamous um, ransomware threat actor groups, um, a security researcher, um, I say that like this because I, I don't know, he basically divulged internal chats of Conti after the Ukrainian conflict started because Conti's affiliated with Russia. And um, they've been translated and they are a wild read. Um, it's like a business. It's like a corporate office talking about what they're doing on their days off, on their vacations, thanking people for the bonuses they're receiving. But then you'll just come across a line where it's like, okay, guys, uh, this is, you know, um, U.S. Healthcare Week. So we're going to try to hit all as many healthcare entities as week as we can. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is a hundred percent a business for them and it's incredibly profitable, but they are well aware of what they do. Um, the one thing with ransomware that we found out not recently, but over the past year and a half, two years, which was bolstered by the Conti, Conti leaks, is a lot of ransomware threat actors will take data and they'll threaten to publish it and say, if you pay us, we'll delete it. They don't delete it. Now, you're basically paying for them not to publish it on the dark web, but for all intents and purposes, there's no evidence anywhere out there that, that they don't delete it. Now, they'll still unencrypt it or decrypt it. <laughs> they'll decrypt your data for you. Um, but you know, they're still criminals. They'll try to get as much money from you as they can. Um, I did have one insured that got hit by ransomware um, twice um, because they had a sysadmin password that was brute forced. We directed them to change it. They did not. Um, and another threat actor group somehow got that information um, and tried to ransom them again. So, and that is our time for today. Thank you guys so much for your time.